involved in uh, the development of a Symbian operating system and he has uh, also been doing research and personal ex experiments on all kinds of uh, personal second brain systems like uh, personal organizers for which he uh, was working on in the context of his company Psyon and currently he runs a company called Symbian and uh, he has a long history of working with with uh, systems that, that were previously mostly personal organizers nowadays they're, they're called uh, smartphones uh, and he's going to talk about the related issues today uh, so I welcome Mr. David Wood from Symbian on this screen as well. Ah, yeah. Uh, and, and this keyboard? Which keyboard is it? Okay. Okay. So, welcome everybody. So I've got the title, which is a bit ambiguous, on purpose. It's the mind-boggling future of the mobile phone. And part of what I want to say is summed up by this little picture, which has come on screen now, which is what's going to happen with the future of mobile phones working closer to the brain, the passage of some time, what it will the outcome be. And if that seems a bit uh, strong a claim, think of uh, mobile phones or the new mobile phone smartphones as miniature PCs. And remember what impact PCs have had on us in terms of making us more productive, allowing us to do a lot of things much more quickly than we could previously do. Smartphones have got the features of phones. Mobile phones have also got the features of miniature PCs, as I'll explain. But I'm not just interested in talking about mobile phones, because interesting so they are, commercially important so they are, they're still a small thing compared to the grand topics that are being covered in this conference, the grand topics of the emerging technologies and what impact they could or should have on all of us. And so I'm going to try to draw out some lessons from my experience with uh, mobile phones for possible other applications of advanced technology. So let's start by introducing myself. Uh, you've had various self-professed cyborgs speaking to you in the past. I can't say I'm a cyborg, but I can say I'm a man with three brains. I was once introduced like that many years ago by a product manager at a conference who I think was trying to say this guy's too clever for his own good. But uh, I've got my biological brain which is now 47 years old and, and Aubrey said yesterday that he still thought as quickly as he did when he was 20 years younger. I'm not sure that's the case with me. I think a good defrag was long overdue for my brain to get rid of a lot of the nonsense that's there and uh, streamline it. That may be a while before that happens. And the second brain is very close to my heart in more ways than one. It's a brain that in one sense I've been carrying for about 18 years since I started working in this company, Sion. And it's got a much better memory. It remembers all kinds of things about what I was doing that I wrote down at the time, which I look up. Close to my heart because a lot of my sweat and tears and, I don't know, some blood went into the many all-night sessions to create these devices. But then we realized that what good is a brain like that if it's not connected? And the more powerful brain in the future isn't just in standalone devices, but in connected devices. And so for the last uh, eight years, We've been focusing the software company I'm signed was spun out into a separate company called Symbian, which I was privileged to be one of the people to make happen. And since that time, I've been carrying another brain, which varies from day to day. Could be a Nokia phone or a Sony Ericsson phone like this or a Samsung or, for example, a Motorola phone. One of the perks of my job is I get to play with a lot of the newest technology. 
And that is in many ways the best brain of all, not because of what's contained in it, but because of what it connects to. And we're used to thinking of phones as communications device, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time just helping you to realize the potential for community, content, commerce as well. And to see these as windows into the digital world, so that uh, uh, if I'm going home on the train, for example, sometimes you know, London transport's a bit squashed, I'm squashed, I uh, can't read a newspaper, except I might see over the shoulder of somebody else is reading an interesting story in a newspaper. I think that's, that's interesting, so I can bring up my phone, look up the BBC website, and very often get a later version of the same news. And more and more people will be doing that. I have another brain as well. In some ways it's the most powerful. It's the laptop, but it's the one I feel less close to for all kinds of reasons. I don't think everybody's going to have three brains in the future, but I think it's quite likely that most people before too long will have two active brains. They'll have the biological brain, certainly, but also their smartphone brain. So as I said, I'm interested in learnings from what has happened in mobile phones, learnings, to what extent can improvements in mobile phones help make humans smarter, wiser, kinder, better. That's certainly long-term motivation. But I want to look at the broader question is, well, to what extent can aspects of this rapid development in mobile phones, and a great deal has happened over the last 20 years, which I'll briefly recap. This isn't just a business that talks about progress. It's a business that very clearly, year after year, makes a great deal of progress. How can similar principles perhaps be applied to speed up the other things which many of us spend our time thinking and wishing would happen? So let's recap. Mobile phones. So the first wave of mobile phones was when they focused on doing one job incredibly well, which was voice, and year after year they improved, they got smaller, they got more reliable, they got lighter, the battery lasted longer, the voice quality improved, and over that time up to about to the year 2000, they became the most ubiquitous item of consumer electronics on the planet with, at that stage, about one billion people. That's one in six of the planet using them. And about that time, a second wave of mobile phones took off, which people call feature phones. And a feature phone isn't just something you listen to and talk into. A feature phone has got a nice big screen. It engages the eye. And the eye, of course, is connected to a much larger part of the brain. The screens became more colorful. The sounds that started emanating from these became more musical, and so on, and lots more memory inside. And that has been a second wave of mobile phones, which has uh, flourished over the last uh, five years or so, and has culminated, as it happens, with about two billion people in the world using mobile phones at the end of 2005. But that's really only the start. And there's much more to come. And the third wave, and by the way, I'm not talking about 1G, 2G, 3G, just in case you're wondering about that. It's just quite a separate thing I'm talking about. The third wave of mobile phones is what we call smartphones. And the key thing about a smartphone is their programmability and the richness of the hardware and the networks that is present can be accessed and improved by many, many third parties. And so you'll get lots more applications created. You get a huge boost in personal productivity and business productivity. And so for that reason, I say with mobile phones, the best is very much still to come. And I've actually drawn the growth dynamics differently because of the open-ended nature. And what I mean by open-ended nature, what do I mean by the open virtuous cycle? I've drawn a simplified version on here. And this is a chart that I use all over the world, and I've been using it for about five years and it was very interesting when I started reading Kurzweil's latest book, and he talks about uh, acceleration of technology happens when growth in one part feeds off growth in another part, and it's not just what happens in one place, it's when multiple uh, uh, streams of improvement feed into each other, and so tools become better, and the tools improvement allows other things to get better. Well, we certainly have had that in the world of mobile phones. We've had networks improving, allowing us more and more bandwidth, and you get 2.5G, GPRS, and 3G, UMTS, and more things are coming with all kinds of acronyms and alphabet soup, in fact, of uh, different network names. The value of these improved networks is only there when people are producing third-party developers or writing applications, and it'll be like what happened with the PCs. PCs did not start off with all the applications in them that today you and I take for granted. 
PCs did not come with spreadsheets built in or PowerPoint built in or Doom built in or all the other kinds of things. These applications were afterthoughts by people just fooling around a little bit, playing in their garage or under the bed or wherever it is that their young teenage developers do their development. And some of them went on to become great businesses and they fed in to the next generation of PCs. And we have the same thing happening now with smartphones, applications are developed, taking advantage of the increasing numbers of programmable phones and then uh, going around the cycle again. And I'll come back to that theme, this theme of a cycle which iterates and which uh, sustains this incremental improvement is very important for making real progress. Uh, just because there are lots of players involved doesn't mean to say, of course, you're going to get progress. With lots of players involved, you often get chaos. I'm sure there's an expression in almost every language which is a bit like too many cooks spoil the broth. So the whole thing to fit together, there does need to be standards, there does need to be an agreed uh, infrastructure, and uh, it's very important that there's an operating system which uh, shares uh, a lot of the strain in allowing these technologies to coexist without getting in each other's way. Now one of the most important words in this, certainly the word open is incredibly important, but the word I want to draw to your attention, and this is the key to driving real progress here, is the word volumes. It's because there are volumes of these phones available that developers are interested in spending their time writing applications for them. What are developers interested in? Some of them are interested in making money, and they're not going to make much money if there's only a few phones available that can run this stuff. Some other developers are interested in fame and fortune, and they're not going to get much fame and fortune if there aren't many phones available to run their software. So what really kicks this off is the volumes, not just in tens of thousands, but even millions. And nowadays, there's almost a, we're approaching 100 million of these uh, smartphones in existence. But where does the volumes come from? And this is very important. So the volumes come as the prices come down, and the prices come down in all kinds of ways, including the cost of the services, including the cost of building this. But a key driver is something that I find again and again when I look at the transhumanist literature, it is Moore's Law. Moore's Law, you all know, applies certainly to computers. Computers get more and more powerful uh, year on year on. Compu Moore's Law also applies very much to what you get in your phones. And year in, year out, the phones get uh, more and more powerful too. But Moore's Law shouldn't just be thought of things getting more powerful. You should think of them in terms of getting more ch cheap, less expensive. And so that it means what you can actually buy for your phone, if you've got a certain budget, you'll find there's more and more power in that every year. But I have to say that Moore's Law isn't something that just happens in abstract. It doesn't uh, happen just because of some uh, celestial ticker going tick, 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 ah, a new discovery here, tick, 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 a new discovery here. It happens in the real laboratories in the, wor in the world. Uh, it used to happen primarily in Intel and associated, associated labs. With mobile phones, some of the creativity and a lot of the very interesting development is happening in another company that some of you may have heard of called Arm, which is actually based uh, near Cambridge. And uh, a lot of the, uh, it's using a different architecture for its chips and uh, chips that uh, do more things with less power, which is again very important because there's no point having a phone that can do all these things if its battery runs out in two hours because it's doing all these extra things. But Moore's Law, and this is one of my themes, Moore's Law is not enough to guarantee a real progress here, and it's not even the main driver. The main driver for a lot of this progress is the open market. It's the competition that takes place, whereby people can see, yes, gosh, there's a big uh, opportunity here. I'd like to get involved in this opportunity, and companies compete to succeed, and the ones that are find the best means of driving down the price that can have the best innovative manufacturing techniques uh, to take advantage of economies of scale will be the ones that succeed. And if I look at uh, the most successful mobile phone company on the planet, which happens to be Nokia by some way, one reason they're so successful is not just because the Moore's Law is on their side, it's because they're finding incredible ways to reduce the cost of manufacturing. They have got incredible skills in that. And why do they bother? It's because, why are they interested? It's because of the potential which is there for growth. Practice makes perfect, and when the incentive is there to practice, then companies will practice very hard. Many companies will practice, and if the open market's there, many will fail, but the ones who have the innovative ideas will succeed. So how will the prices come down? I and mean, this is just a recap on what Moore's Law means for smartphones. won't go into all the figures, just to give you an illustrative uh, picture. Uh, this is Simeon's estimate, my company's estimate, of the cost 
of manufacturing a smartphone, this so-called bill of materials. What goes into a smartphone, the things like the screen is a large part of the cost, there's the battery, there's the RAM, there's the ROM, there's the, all these alphabet soup of different things, digital baseband, but as time moves on, Moore's Law and similar things apply in different ways, and so that by 2006, we are something like two-thirds of the way down the price, and by 2009, we'll be halfway down the price overall. And if you superimpose that on the main growth of all mobile phones, this year alone, and this is quite a conservative estimate, I think it's likely that this year alone, 2006, there might be one billion phones of all sorts sold in the world. When you superimpose the two bits of analysis together and think, well, how many of these phones will be affordable enough to have a more technology in them to be smartphones, you get something like that. So the proportion of phones which are miniature PCs with all these extra applications going there is growing ahead of the overall schedule. And so this year, 200 million smartphones could be created or people could afford to buy them and as we go on 600 million by the end of the year. So this is going very wide and far. But, but, and this is one of my lessons for a, all kinds of accelerated technology. Just because this kind of analysis can be done, which shows that something is technically possible, it certainly does not mean that that is actually going to happen in the market. And businesses are very much aware of that. The businesses have another word for this, and it's another Moore's Law. And that's what I'm going to take you through. Moore, there are many people called Moore. There's Gordon Moore, the one of the co-founders of Intel, whose law, as we've already discussed, and I want to discuss Jeffrey Moore's law. And if you haven't done any reading in technology marketing, a good place to start is this book, Crossing the Chasm, by Jeffrey Moore. Uh, it's quite dated in some of the examples he gives, but a lot of the theory is absolutely the same. And it says, look, Naively, we divide up the marketplace into a spectrum, and there are guys way out here on this wing who are the enthusiasts who are buy things just because they're cool. And then there are people who are the early adopters who've got the vision. They say, yes, I can see there will be a benefit from this, and I'm prepared to put up with some pain to make it happen. And then there are the early majority and late majority. And naively, you think, well, when you're successful in breaking through and getting some geek interest, and getting some magazines like Wire to write about your technology, and when you can do the spreadsheets that I've just done, then you've got it made. You just need to keep on doing it. And Gordon Moore, uh, sorry, Jeffrey Moore's point is, no, hang on, there's a big chasm in between that first bunch of people and the later. And uh, Jeffrey Moore talks about many, many companies die in the chasm because they just let the technologists run the company, and at this stage, a very bad thing or a very surprising thing has to happen, which is the marketeers have got to take over running the company. And that's a very painful thing, especially if you're a technologist. Or you can have a brain transplant and become more marketing savvy yourself. So, what happens? Uh, first of all, the people who are the other technologists, they're buying into it because, well, they like technology and they like features. Whereas the mainstream, they're not buying technology for that. If there's any risk to it not being reliable, they're not going to invest their money in it and they're only interested in complete solutions and convenience. They're not interested in debugging it, they're not interested in taking it back to the shop and saying, well, it didn't quite work, would you spend a few hours with me explaining to me how to set it up? The guys on this wing over here are willing to accept a certain amount of poor usability because, hey, they can cope with it, whereas the mainstream won't accept poor usability. So the guys out here don't mind the smartphone, to be specific, they don't mind the smartphone taking maybe 30 seconds to boot up, because they think, hey, there's 125 different threads here. This is cool. This is building up a lot faster than my laptop. Whereas the people on this mainstream just say, stupid phone, and throw it away. And they're not interested in the possibility of the extra stuff. So crossing that chasm is about uh, focusing on usability and reliability. It's about, as Jeffrey Moore also says, coming up with a few bowling pin solutions, which are a few things you've got to focus if you try and do 101 different things, you will never cross the chasm. You will die off. You must not pursue every sales lead. You must tie up the hands of your salesmen in this phase because your salesmen will commit you to all kinds of things and you've got to apply some real discipline in figuring out what are the few bowling pins that you're going to target to knock down and once you've knocked down the first few, then more are going to follow. So the good news is that mobile phones have gone through most of this cycle. Uh, let's talk about one other person I know, my mother. My mother did not buy a mobile phone because she's an early adopter. She didn't buy a mobile phone because I, her son, have uh, been spent a lot of my life in this mobile phone industry. No, she said, 
One of her best friends bought a mobile phone and guess it wasn't too bad. And so she bought exactly the same phone, which is a pretty dumb phone. But now she's typing away lovely text messages, beautiful punctuation. She's the only person I know that has uh, text messages with completely correct punctuation. So, yeah, the early majority are not interested in buying things because they read about them in the newspapers. They're only interested in buying it because they're, they're other good friends uh, sort of already trying. So you've got to break through into that. So mobile phones have broken through. Smartphones will do the same thing. I'll just run through this very quickly. First of all, because they build on what has caused mobile phones themselves to be so successful. First of all, people buy mobile phones to communicate. We call ourselves homo sapiens. We might also call ourselves homo communicanians or homo chatterboxes because we just love to communicate. You know, everybody likes to chat away. And if we can provide more means to communicate and to message, then that will drive uh, more adoption. And indeed, uh, smartphones with built-in email are very much a growth uh, medium. Then people buy phones thinking, well, whatever happens to me, if my car breaks down or I get lost, I'll be able to communicate. And we can build on this by providing the information that anybody needs in context in a prompt way. And third, very important, people buy phones not just because of the technology, especially teenagers. We've never seen, we've seen dead buying an old, uh, boring phone. And they buy them because they're fashionable and they're fun and they're personalized. And teenagers are very money-centered. They won't uh, spend a lot of money unnecessarily. They don't like spending money buying music. But guess what? They will spend money, a lot of money, downloading the latest ringtone because the worst thing that can happen is if your phone rings and it's uh, a month-old music, you know? That really shows how behind the times you are. So, got, so anyway, just to come to the cut to the chase, uh, building on the needs there, personalizing, uh, allowing phones to be personalized, provided... You keep on doing it simply, even though in behind the scenes it's very complicated. And then, on that basis, without losing the simplicity and ease of use, we can start doing much more interesting stuff, like becoming the gateway into this digital universe that I spoke about. So what do I mean digital universe? I mean all the places that you and I tend to spend some of our time online. So Google, and the centerpiece of all the knowledge. Uh, Yahoo, booking travel, looking up maps. Uh, Wikipedia, again, source of knowledge, uh, various kinds of news sites, sports sites, video sites, uh, and all kinds of fun and games. And so the places that people visit on their PCs, increasingly they will be visiting them on the mobile phones, for its convenience. I mentioned I visit the BBC quite often, partly because I'm British and I'm biased, partly because I find it gives me the news that I want wherever I go, when I'm squashed up in a train, I uh, found uh, I visit Amazon.com. Surprisingly enough, when I'm in a real-world bookshop, I find it's very useful to take out my smartphone. I pick a book from the shelf, and what does the back of the book say? The greatest book ever. This book will change your life. You absolutely need to buy this book. Uh, I never found a book with a review in the back that says, this is so, so this is re re uh, just regurgitating his previous book. So I'll look up Amazon.com, and what they say there, I get a much more, ba a much more balanced view then I'll decide whether to buy that book there and then. And so on it goes. Where else do I spend time on the internet? I guess Google, yeah. And uh, Google makes me much wiser than I was before. So that when an unexpected thing happens, if I'm in a conference and one of my competitors makes a strange claim, and just before I speak, I can look it up on Google and I can hopefully find something to refute him with. Or this morning, somebody mentioned about, uh, what was it, Bluetooth sniper gun. And I remember thinking, yeah, this is, a, I remember thinking it wasn't quite as black as the, some of the news reports uh, they made it out to be. So I looked it up on Google, found it there and then, and was able to convince myself, at least if nobody else, that there isn't a real security risk here. It's just a bad implementation on some particular phones. Now, you may be thinking, oh, no, this is just a pipe dream. Uh, people aren't going to use these small little screens and these poor little fiddly keyboards that give you a headache if you try and type things in to actually do a lot of research and extend their brains. But lots and lots of things are happening. And again, this is the theme of progress, which is why I want to talk about it. What is actually driving this progress? First of all, there's faster bandwidth, and that extra bandwidth makes a lot of difference. Once upon a time, the World Wide Web on the PC was a boring and slow and frustrating thing. You remember WWW? Remember what that used to stand for? World Wide Wait, you know? You, spend all, you type in the URL and you have to wait and before it comes back. That's all a thing of the past for most of us. We've got broadband and the stuff comes down much faster. Well, it's happening the same on the mobile phones. As these new networks become available, including wireless networks, more is available too. Then there's the screens. And you have to see the screens on the new phones to believe them. 
There is a rapid virtuous cycle of improvement there too. Lots of manufacturers all chasing the same juicy target market. Uh, they can in plug in each other's uh, uh, different manufacturers. Phone manufacturers can pick and choose the different screens they'd like to put in. They get more pixels. The pixels are smaller, so there's higher resolution. There's more shades of color, so you, again, it's easier to see. And all kinds of clever things, so that even in bright lights or dark lights, you can see them. So the screens are improving. The user interfaces are improving, and it's the same step-by-step -step means. Uh, handwriting recognition is improved, so that you can, if you don't like typing in, you can just scribble and it makes sense of it. And the next step is, you just type the first two or three letters of the word and it puts up at the top of the screen what, you actually think, what it thinks you're typing. So you can just do two letters and then click. And if it's even more intelligent, it actually remembers the words that you tend to type in. So in my case, I get Symbian coming up pretty fast. And then there's all kinds of other things that I don't have time to go into, including voice recognition, which is sort of here, but not quite and before long, brainwaves, which uh, is an extension of Bluetooth headsets. You know, today we, people plug in Bluetooth headsets, and then um, with a little bit more of a coverage of the scalp, before too many years, they'll be picking up the brainwaves and you'll be interfacing like that. Now, that is a little bit more in the future. Most of the other stuff I'm talking about is here or hereabouts. And then there's the software. And the software is not to be underestimated. One of the big themes that I will talk about, given more time, is the importance of software to uh, lay out the screen in an intelligent way so that although you're used to a particular layout and the website uh, presuppose a particular layout, then intelligent software will lay it out on a narrow screen and uh, do a lot of good for you. Other things that intelligent software will do, not just in, in, uh, intelligent word completion, in due course they'll do intelligent sentence completion. And I heard recently one of the founders of Google talking about their hope that the Google's interface will change so that when you ask it a question, it will actually answer not the question you asked, but the question you were trying to ask. And you know, when you're talking to friends, sometimes you can figure out what they actually want to say, even though they haven't put the best words in themselves. And so that kind of things will come. And so more and more things to software. And very briefly, before I start uh, winding up and moving to the next theme, uh, hardware is still obviously very important in these devices but a lot of the progress is actually tied up in how quickly can we solve the problem of increasing software. The larger screen needs uh, better software to lay it out and take full use of it. Then there's more applications, more technology, and more customization and personalization. And so more and more of this is actually held up, not because of how much time does it take to improve the hardware. The hardware does improve pretty fast. It's the software that takes a lot longer. Mobile gateway into the digital universe. That's the start. But these devices are much more. I sometimes call them a pocket melting pot. Still haven't found the right word for this. If I was American, I might say synergizer. Uh, what I mean is that what's included in these devices, and often with very useful and very surprising results, is a whole combination of other pieces of functionality which formerly were separate, formerly you wouldn't bother taking with you, but more and more of these devices have more and more of this kind of functionality built in. So BlackBerry, health monitoring devices, and increasingly even you can use these devices as tickets, wallets, and keys. And this is only the start. I was in Japan recently with one of my colleagues, and he was taking me to a meeting, and actually he started getting lost, and he held the map in front of his phone. It was getting a bit dark. I thought, what's he going to do? How is he going to find the way there? And he pressed a button on the phone, and guess what? A light came on. And I thought, oh, he's using his mobile phone as a torch. Yes, indeed, yet another piece of functionality built in. Not quite as intelligent as what I thought it was going to do, but still very, very useful nonetheless. But what's interesting isn't just the functionality that's there, it's the combinations of functionality which will lead to us being more productive and more effective. So let's look at, say, dictionary. Often if I go to a foreign country, it makes sense for me to carry a dictionary. But I've only got so many pockets off and I don't. A dictionary to help me understand the language. Far better if you can use the intelligence and the camera that's built into these devices and the network connectivity that's in these devices to do a lot of the translation for me. So in the old world, I might find a sign. I wonder what it means. I have to look up the dictionary uh, and find it. Uh, that's okay if it's using a Latin script. If it's a Cyrillic script, I'm probably stuck. If it's a Thai script or a Hebrew script or China, I'm even more difficult. But using the camera that's built in here, and this can't do this quite yet, but I'm sure the application isn't far away. You take a photograph of it. It sends the picture up to the network. It wouldn't have all the intelligence built in here for all the languages in the world, even, even with the memory that's there. But the network has that intelligence. It sends it up there. It will come back with the answer. 
beware of the alligators, or you are lost, or whatever it is, in the language that I wanted. So that's one instance of how the different combinations add to the functionality and the power and the smartness. Just one more before I move on. Music player. So more and more people are using their phones as the iPod replacements, and they can do that because there's more functionality. It's already wirelessly enabled, so if you fancy a new piece of music, you can get that easily. But even more, you can use the rich user interface that's on these devices to edit the music and to change it and to mix the beats. And I saw a video just the other day of some teenagers and young DJs that were enthusing about the music mixing capabilities built into the latest phones. And one of them actually said, this is the next electric guitar. In other words, teenagers love to play electric guitars, or used to anyway, and make all kinds of cool music, and now you can actually mix up the music on your mobile phone. So, let's not talk any more about that. Let's just uh, pull this together. Uh, Mind-transforming effects of smartphones. Uh, is this technology causing us to go sick and go crazy? Uh, on the whole, no, especially youngsters just take it in their stride, and those of us sufficiently young in heart can take it in our stride too. And that is interesting because when I read the prognosis of people sometimes afraid of accelerating technology, they say, we're just not going to cope. Well, that's not my experience with this accelerating technology. And then, as I said, I believe this does make us smarter because, first, it's a better memory than, than in many ways we've got. Second, it keeps us in touch with key information. And even more important, with the key people that's important to us, our friends, whether we're going to instant message them or talk on forums. And out of that, we get not just knowledge, but hopefully we get a bit of wisdom, because if we're not quite sure of something, we can ask the people we really trust quite quickly wherever we are and move forward. And that is uh, very important. These devices also have the ability to help organizers as the functionality of the PDA becomes increasingly present there, make us more productive, better mentored, and more choice. And so it's very much my view, and this is a view I share as I go around the world, that smartphones indeed will become increasingly smarter than their human users. And of course, this isn't a simple yes-no thing. Smartness has many, many dimensions. Just because my smartphone can beat me at chess doesn't mean it's smarter than me. But increasingly, it's doing more and more things better than I will do. And perhaps in 10 or 15 years' time, smartphones will be broadly as intelligent as their users. I found this slide on our marketing uh, department. This is kind of the big picture. Smartphones equal smart lives, more achieve, more leisure, more pleasure. That's what we're interested in transforming. And just another thing, just to say, where are these phones going? Found this other bit of uh, marketing uh, literature just uh, uh, recently the new, uh, released about the waterproof phone. So I thought at first they're going after the dolphin market. These phones, we had that in uh, Nokia was uh, interested in selling phones to dogs and cats. Well, not quite serious about that. At one stage, uh, certainly the Japanese network operators were trying to convince people to buy phones for their dogs because you could track them. I think they've realized now you don't need that. But certainly this could be the phone for the person who wants to keep on chatting while in the shower. I don't know. So busy. Or at least probably it's for this woman here who wants to keep on doing her email in the bath and she's afraid. What happens if she falls asleep and drops her phone in the bath? Well, rest assured, uh, everything will be all right. So that's the kind of thing, not just about uh, more technology, but real uh, improvement to life. So if that's whetted your interest, more information about smartphones, the most profound book I've found on this topic so far is by an American. Uh, his name is uh, Howard Rheingold. He has a history of writing quite prophetic books about the impact of technology. He's called this Smart Mobs, the next social revolution. It's a pun. Uh, mobs meaning mobiles and also mobs meaning organizations of people, including chaotic organizations. The most prolific author on the smartphones is a Finn called Tommy Ahanen, and he's got a variety of books which uh, he issues, and the, if you're interested to look, probably the most pertinent source of information, I have to say this, of course, is at my own company website, where there's lots of up-to-date stuff, and in case some of this has whetted your uh, appetite for more, there is a free conference, uh, no charge for entering it, uh, which will be in October in the Docklands in London, and if you're interested, you can find out more on the website. But, let me come back to the theme I started at the beginning. I said there's two things I'm trying to cover. I'm trying to share some of my conviction that the uh, smartphones are playing some part, and clearly it's not going to do it by itself, but playing some part in making humans quite quickly more smarter and even possibly wiser. And, uh, and now I want to look 
just to recap on what, to what extent can the lessons that I've seen potentially be applied to other aspects of technology. And here I'm going off piece, though I claim to know a lot about mobile phones, I know much less about all these other enhancement technologies, and it's quite possible that the advice I give here will be totally unsuited, in which case, well, at least I tried, but uh, let me have a go anyway. And I'm going to give two kinds of a uh, driver for progress, which have made a big difference to the success of mobile phones. And the first kind of driver is a dirty word in many corners, but it's clearly very important, and that is the commercial drivers for uh, people getting involved in improving the technology. It's the smell of money, and uh, it's the smell of uh, the opportunity to become rich, which is, well, let me just uh, compare two things. Let me compare this conference, Transvision 06, with the corresponding conference for the mobile phone world. I don't know if there is a single corresponding thing, but the nearest I could think of was an annual conference called uh, 3GSM, which has changed its name various times. And uh, I've been there for about five years in a row, and according to their website, they had uh, 50,913 attendees. It felt like a lot more, because there's just enormous hustle and bustle there, and no less than 2,085 media personnel. I don't know how many people from the media we've got here, but uh, clearly it's still early days up to 20 seminar tracks. So why have mobile phones got such a big conference and Transvision is at a much earlier phase in its career? Well, one part, of course, is timing, but another part is this aspect of money. And people are there because they think, or their companies think, not necessarily the individuals, but the companies are driven, who after all are driven by business. I've got this quote here from the well-known guru Milton Friedman. It may not be ever be his favourite but he does describe how the business world works. The business of business is business, in other words, making money, and making money in a feasible way. And so what drives these companies to participate and to invest their time isn't just some altruism, isn't just thinking this is cool technology. The company is there because they can see an opportunity to make money. And just because something's technically feasible is not going to interest them, as I've said, it has to be there with the potential for being transferred into things that people really will buy on large scale. It has to satisfy human need. It's got to be available at a sufficiently attractive price. It's got to be sufficiently usable, which means that the mainstream users at least won't have to change their life in a drastic way to take advantage of it. But even that isn't enough. And there are many businesses which have got these claims, but they still don't get serious investment and they still don't get their serious progress. And the key to going further than that is the open virtuous cycle which I spoke about at the beginning. What I mean there is that real progress typically comes from a series of steps. An eventual version of a massively innovative technology is almost always attained through a series of incremental steps, where each step adds some value in its own right, and where each step has business and commercial sense. And just many, many things fail because they sound great, but people just can't see a way to have any confidence there's going to be a return on money in a, in a short time. And what you need here then is a credible roadmap. And a credible roadmap says, well, what are we going to do this year, next year, next year? And then you must not talk about a million things there. You must say clearly, this is the thing that we're focusing on and this is how we are going to achieve that. And you also need a mechanism to convince well, uh, people that you can deal with bottlenecks. And the bottlenecks come up all the time. It's one thing to have a bright idea, but then you try to implement it and you get stuck. So how do you get the energy? How do you get the momentum to get through being stuck? It is, again, by openness. An openness which encourages new thinking, doesn't just say, well, we know best, uh, so therefore we're going to dictate it our ways. Uh, it's an openness which accepts new ideas and which encourages people to keep on trying. And although many companies fail, enough of them will keep on trying and some of them will come up with the new information and uh, be successful. So that's the commercial driver. The, and here's the open virtuous cycle that explains that. But the last driver that I want to talk about is the other thing that's propelled so much progress in the mobile phone world and which can propel progress in many other areas too and that is the hacker ethic, or the passion. And uh, just mention this uh, book by a couple of friends who describe it very well, I think. 
So this isn't the motivation for companies. I've spoken about that. This is the motivation that causes individuals to do extraordinary things on a long-term basis. And this book is uh, self-consciously modelled on another epoch-making uh, sociological book from 100 years previously, almost exactly 100 years earlier, Max Weber, uh, described the spirit of capitalism and the Protestant uh, work ethic and uh, in this book it neatly captures what are the themes by which is motivating people either as individuals or working in companies to actually make a trans uh, huge progress. So I don't have time to go into all of this but broadly these are the seven goals that are important for the commercial world, things like money, work, optimality, flexibility and so on. You have to be accountable for your results but what motivates the hackers and what we, if we're interested in making progress generally with transhumanism, have got to tap into as well is corresponding things. People don't work primarily for money, though money is our part of it, but it's only the lowest rung of the hierarchy of needs for individuals. It's things like passion. I mean, people do it uh, and the time's their own and they're doing it because it is actually uh, appealing to their value of worth and it's appealing to their creativity and their caringness. And so to summarise everything I've said in this one picture again, the way that the progress will come, absolutely I believe that technology has a big, big role in uh, improving our lives in all kinds of ways, making us smarter. That technology will only really flourish and go forward if it's developed in an open environment with open markets and corresponding things like an open industrial cycle, and that certainly includes a collaborative spirit or a democratic, a democratic uh, incentive, if you like. But finally, and the thing I've been talking about, is we have to uh, engage not just the minds, but also the hearts. And that's where we get the deepest motivation, and that's where we get the best progress. And if we can do that, certainly the best is still to come. Thank you very much.